Hello, everyone. This is Joe Brewer here again for another one of our great webinars that we're going to have in this learning journey. This is our second one today. Welcome to uh, the session that we'll have discussing cultural scaffolding and social niche construction. We're going to kind of dabble into both of these. And I'm seeing in the comment thread that uh, a storm hit New York last night and is causing flooding in the subways. Gail, is that really true? Wow. Wow, that's that's kind of intense. I remember, <laughs> um, remember when the hurricane hit a few years ago that um, yeah, this was happening, but it's crazy it's happening again. Well, welcome everyone. Um, today we're gonna be talking about something that I feel is, like you'll see my opening slide and when we get into the presentation is like, the two most important concepts for sustainability that almost no one knows about or talks about. And so today is going to be like a, an opportunity for us to delve into what I think is probably some of the most useful and in some ways some of the most challenging uh, ideas for us to apply to our own lives as we try to become more regenerative. And today, while we're waiting for more people to arrive, I wanted to just um, do two really quick polls to gauge how familiar all of you are with the concepts we'll be discussing today. So I'm going to give you the first poll right now, which is this one. I'm just curious, have you heard of cultural scaffolding before? Just give me a yes, no, or a not sure. And we'll get a sense of, you know, who knows what this is? Who's heard me talk about it? Um, who's heard it discussed in some other context? Just wanting to get a feel for how new and um, how different this concept is. Because today I will explain what cultural scaffolding is. And it's good to see that while several of you are familiar, there are already quite a few, four of the 11 votes so far, who say you're not familiar with it. So that's good to know. I'm just you know wanting to get a feel for how we, um, how we get started and what level of depth I can begin with. Then I have another question here when you're done with that one. This other question is, do you know what niche construction is? And I'm um, sorry, I added an extra A in there, not do you know what A niche construction is? <laughs> do you know what niche construction is? Sorry about that mistake. And maybe is a good answer here, which is like, you think like, I think I know what that means, um, but I'm not sure. So it's a sort of, have you heard the term before and are you familiar with it? So what we're gonna find today is this concept of niche construction that is really important in biology and ecology is also gonna be very important for human cultural evolution and for our attempts to become more regenerative. So I see that several of you have said yes and a lot of you are sitting on the fence and not sure. So that's good to know, that, that's helpful. So thank you for taking these quick polls, which gives us a, a way of interacting a bit as we're getting started today. Um, what we're going to be doing today is, as we do in every one of these sessions, is I'm gonna give a presentation for about a half an hour, you know, 25 or 30 minutes. And then we'll have about a half an hour for Q&A discussions. And so during the presentation, you can use this ask a question button down here to write any question you would like to have answered. And also very importantly, to vote for the questions other people pose that you would like to have answered. Because during the Q&A, we will pick the questions that get the most requests for an answer, that get the most votes. And the people asking the questions will be invited into a video screen where they can join me and we can have a discussion about their question. So if you have a question during the presentation, just drop it there and um, we'll be able to discuss it after the presentation portion is over. So how about if we just jump right in so we make really good use of our time today. And what I wanna say when we begin is that this idea of living into the design pathway for regenerating Earth that we introduced in the webinar last week requires us to look at the social supports that are around us or the social obstacles or absence of supports that would make it difficult for us to make changes and really get a clear understanding of what they are and how they work so that we can be supported or create or find support where we don't have it 
to be able to make needed changes. And so today I'm going to go into some topics that are a bit academic, a bit theoretical, and they come from the research world. And yet they're very relevant to this question of how do I make changes in my own life to leave the extractive economy and become more regenerative? So I'm hoping that this will be helpful and clarifying and also ultimately empowering for making effective decisions. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started and I'll share my screen. And so today we're going to talk about two of the most important concepts for sustainability that a lot of people don't know. And these are cultural scaffolding and social niche construction. You know, I named this webinar, What is Cultural Scaffolding? So we'll be spending more of our time discussing it and less time in social niche construction. But you'll see that the two are gonna go hand in hand. And I start with this graphic, this strange picture of balls rolling down different contour like channels, because this is um, a visual diagram published in the early 1950s by a guy named Edding, uh, yeah, Eddington, and Ed William Eddington, I believe, where he was a developmental biologist. And this is what he calls an epigenetic landscape, which says that at some earlier point in the process, you choose from one side or the other, and then work has to be done to move from one side to the other, to go over these hills in between the valleys as a way of visually representing that development creates support structures that direct future development and hinder where the future development might go. And we're going to understand better what that means with the idea of cultural scaffolding. So first, what is scaffolding? Let's, let's leave the cultural part aside for a moment. Scaffolding for a building or for some kind of built structure is just a support, but it's a support that is used developmentally while you are constructing the building, you use a scaffold. When the building is able to stand on its own at a later stage in the process, you can take the scaffolding down and you don't need it anymore. So what that means is in the time that is flowing as something is being created, a scaffold is simply a support structure for a specific moment or a period of that development, and then it's not needed later. So if we take that idea and apply it to something like early childhood development, think of all of the supports that were needed at different moments in your life that weren't needed later. So there might have been moments when you needed someone to hold you and carry you around because you couldn't walk on your own, or you needed someone to hold your hand while you found your balance and strengthened your muscles so your legs could actually carry you as you learned how to walk. Or also you might have a social or cultural scaffold of someone speaking to you in a language of the culture you're born into, like I was born in an English speaking culture. So someone speaking English to you so that you learn the language and you can communicate with other people. But you may not need to learn that basic language skill at a later time in your development. So the idea is cultural scaffolding is these support structures that intervene and help the future development of some capacities that a person or a community needs. And there's so many kinds of support that fit this description of cultural scaffolding. But wait, I wanna stop, and those of you who watched the other video that I produced um, about this topic back in 2017 will know that there's actually a deeper perspective in thinking about how these scaffolds work that's gonna give us a grounding in the limitations of physics. Or said another way, there are some things that are physically possible to do and other things that are not physically possible to do, and we need to know the difference. And we're gonna take a little detour into thermodynamics to see how scaffolding processes in general work for creating patterns. So there's this really powerful concept in thermodynamics that a lot of people are confused about and gets talked about quite a lot. It's a concept called entropy. Entropy is sometimes described as the amount of order or disorder that's in some system that you're looking at. Another way of thinking about it is how much information do you need to provide to fully describe the system you're looking at? Thought of in that way, this set of circles that are collected in a square that I call low entropy, notice how there's so much organization, so much uniformity in the way the pattern is set up 
you wouldn't need very much information to describe the whole thing. You could just give an up version and a left to right version of some number, and it would position every one of those balls. But if you look at the one on the right that I call high entropy, what it means is it's less organized, it's more disordered. You would have to have more information to describe it because it's not homogeneous. So this way of thinking about how much information is needed to describe the complexity of the relationships to the parts of a system is called entropy. And what's important about entropy is there's this thing called the second law of thermodynamics, which says any time that heat is exchanged between different parts of a system, entropy cannot go down. Which means if you have a system that has high entropy and you wanna to move to low entropy, you have to do work on the system in a way that actually increases the entropy somewhere else so that the overall amount of entropy does not go down. And this is a physical limit that no process in the universe can violate. So what's interesting is if we could ever go from a disordered state to an ordered state, uh, less organized to a more organized, without having to do work and creating disorder somewhere else, then how does complexity arise? How can we take a simple set of relationships and make them more complex? What I have here on the bottom that says figures one through five is a famous simple fractal called the Sierpinski triangle. And you produce it in a really easy way. You take a, a trilateral, you know, a uniform triangle like the one in figure one, and you just take a specific segment out in figure two. It's like you take your scissors and cut that section and take it away. And then you're left with three identical triangles that are each one third the size of the original or I guess one fourth the size in terms of area, because you've taken one fourth of the area away. And now you repeat that same process for every new triangle. So each of these three triangles, you take out the middle and you get figure three. And you can keep repeating this process as long as you want and create a fractal. What's interesting about this is there's a very simple way of creating complexity by knowing how to repeat the same pattern over and over and over again. In this case, every time there's a triangle, cut out the middle of the triangle, and then you get more triangles, and for all of those, repeat. That's a very simple rule for how to generate complexity. So the question is, can you do that without violating the laws of thermodynamics? Well, it turns out there's a limitation. If you take something like this fine crystal goblet and you make a really loud sound and you shatter it and break it to pieces, what you've done is taken something that's highly ordered and you've broken it apart into high disorder. You've broken it into little shrapnel and pieces. What the second law of thermodynamics tells us is that it's extremely unlikely that all of the atoms and molecules in this broken glass on the right would just randomly reorganize themselves and pop back together into the perfect crystal structure of that original wine glass. This irreversibility says that for something to go from a highly ordered state to a highly disordered state, you just have to add energy to it. But to take it from the highly disordered state back to the ordered state, you have to do a huge amount of work. And here it's molecule by molecule, atom by atom, placing them back in a perfect crystal lattice. And what this tells us is that for practical purposes, it is impossible that the broken glass would just naturally, spontaneously reorganize itself into the completed wine glass. And that gives us a directionality of how entropy works. That you go from low disorder to high disorder, but you don't go in the other direction, which sets a constraint on how patterns can form for anything that you're creating. So how do we create pattern structures that actually generate the capacity to create new structures? So said another way, does this slime mold violate the laws of physics? as it's growing out across its Petri dish and creating all these complex tendrils and waves within it, all these little ripple patterns, it actually does not violate the laws of thermodynamics because what happens is it is growing through local interactions between the molecules, or in this case, the individual slime mold cells. And as they interact with each other, they look for the lowest energy way or the easiest, the way that requires the least amount of energy to do it, to get to their next place that they need to be. And as they do this, they do something called self-organization. 
they organize themselves through their local interactions. And the global pattern is not created by anyone. It just emerges through all of these local interactions. So what's interesting about this is we can start to ask, well, how do these structures form and how do they constrain what is or isn't possible every step along the way? And to understand that, it really helps to look at how an ice, a snow crystal forms. This is an actual video of a snow crystal forming. And what's interesting to see is early in the process, it's about to repeat itself, that you can see that there are deposits of ice on the end points of each of those radial arms that's going out. And as they grow, what happens is the air goes from liquid to ice, or so goes from vapor to ice. As it goes from vapor to ice, which is cooling, it releases heat into the air around it, which means you end up with the heat of the air being hotter in some places and cooler in other places. And this creates a constraint on the symmetry of growth. Or said another way, the thermodynamics of how this pattern forms limits and constrains the direction that the growth can occur, which means the scaffolding here is the self-organizing process itself. The energy exchange in water vapor becoming ice, causing the air around it to get hotter, creates developmental constraints on the snow crystal. So seeing it in this way that there are actual supports, scaffolding, for the development of this process, but they're dynamic, interacting, and evolving throughout the process, which is how cultural scaffolding happens in humans, which means cultural scaffolding is directional and biased and has constraints that allow some things to happen while making other things more difficult. So I wanted that little detour because as we talk about cultural scaffolding, I wanna make it clear that not every pattern is possible. The most extreme way to say this is cultural scaffolding cannot violate the laws of physics. But another way of thinking of this is that the complex interactions are what actually create the scaffolding, just like for the snow crystal. And so cultural scaffolding, by the researchers who study this, describe it as interactions that are generative, meaning interactions that generate the development of the person or generate the development of the technology. And their interactions between actors, or human beings, artifacts, which could be like tools and objects. Here we have a chalkboard and a piece of chalk. Practices like writing or doing arithmetic. And infrastructure, like in this case, a classroom and a school that enable the culture to build on itself. So the important thing here is culture scaffolding is a combination of people doing things, using things to do them, the things that they're doing and the environmental context and the supports of those environments all interacting together that create cultural scaffolding. So here you can see the cultural scaffolding of a set of toys and a soft carpet and a mother helping her child stand up as they're learning how to walk. But in another context, the artifact is that there's a smooth floor for dragging your feet to do ballet. Another artifact might be the tutus or the tights, the clothes that help the teacher see really well, the alignment of the children's bodies as they're doing their techniques. The teacher is teaching the students and they have a ballet classroom or a dance studio. And even other practices like these two women doing chemistry in this picture, you can see that there's a laboratory and tools and part of their cultural scaffolding is a set of conceptual knowledge about the science and the theories of chemistry. So what's interesting is in each of these cases, the actors, artifacts, practices, and infrastructure are all interacting to scaffold the development of learning how to walk, to dance, or to do scientific work. But this is true for any part of human culture. So cultural scaffolding is something that is always present and always directing us like, for example, these two women doing chemistry, for a very long time, most scientists were only men. So there had to be changes in institutional practices and social norms for women to gain access to the laboratory. So what this tells us is that this realm of social values and institutional practices can shape and limit who is able to participate in a particular practice or who is empowered or encouraged to. So cultural scaffolding can be very powerful. And at the larger sociological scale, cultural scaffolding gives rise to something very special called cumulative cultural evolution. And all of this means is that as 
something in culture evolves, like say the changing style of a particular automobile, it actually can accumulate and add on things that worked before. So it always had four wheels and that never changes, but the type of chemical process for making the glass might make the glass shatter resistant. And so various pieces of this car get integrated into increasingly complex and advanced forms of technology through the accumulation of cultural evolution and the developmental process of prototyping and iterating to make new models of the car is actually a scaffolding process that enables this to happen. And in some cases, this cumulative process can become takeoff and become exponential. And so the important thing here is the cultural scaffolding enables the process itself to evolve as the process is unfolding and can have qualitatively different aspects to it or capacities at a later stage than at an earlier stage. So cultural scaffolding is quite a nuanced and sophisticated concept, but it basically tells us how does development happen within a human culture? How does technology get developed? How does a human being develop across their lifespan? How does an institution and its practices develop over time? All of these are questions of cultural scaffolding. What's interesting though, is you can see that the scaffolding process, which supports development, also creates entrenchment of structures, which means that the structures that form early become constraints on what can happen later. And here you can see aerial photographs of Disneyland when it was being built. And what you can see is the basic geographic layout, the ge geometry in space, is just accumulating complexity over time, but it's all staying in the same place. So what's interesting to see about this is the structures they built at the beginning constrained what was possible to build later so that they couldn't go and just have a blank slate and erase the land and erase the buildings and just put things anywhere they wanted. That would have been too costly to reverse. So this is like that wine glass that explodes, that after it explodes, you can't put it back together again. But here we're going in the other direction. We're increasing entropy. We're increasing the complexity of the relationships in space and time. But as we do it, we create entrenchment, which means it gets harder and harder to change those foundational structures later. If you want an example to really ponder, ask yourself, what are the entrenchment structures of the fossil fuel industry as it relates to modern society and globalization? And you'll start to see that this question of entrenchment is extremely important as a cultural scaffolding process. Also, the scaffolding can be multifaceted and entrenched. If you start looking at a cityscape like this one, where you can see that all of the built infrastructure is gonna make it extremely difficult to change the architecture and layout of a city that is this entrenched, that has so many dynamic features driving its evolution in the same direction, that shifting that direction gets more difficult, the more complex the entrenchment of the city. And this is gonna apply for any kind of cultural scaffolding at large and small scales. The scale of you making life choices if you live in this city or urban planners trying to change the design of the city to make it more sustainable. So here's the thing that I wanna say. There was a movie called The Inconvenient Truth that came out in 2007, created quite a stir, and it actually wasn't that much of an inconvenient truth. The real inconvenient truth is this. This developmental pattern of cultural scaffolding and societal entrenchment has locked us into planetary collapse, which is already decades in the making. Many irreversible processes that we can't reverse them without violating the laws of physics. Many of them have already crossed critical thresholds. What that means is only those who understand this will be living in reality as it actually is. So there are a lot of people who don't understand clearly how cultural scaffolding works and how developmental entrenchment works. And if they don't understand how those two things relate to the development and evolution of a society, then they won't see how locked in we already are to a collapse process. And those of us who do understand this will have a much better sense of what can be changed and what can't be changed, which means we'll be operating from the world as it really is instead of our mythologies, our illusions, our perceptions that aren't based on reality. 
And so this is a very inconvenient truth because it says many interventions to try to achieve sustainability are not going to work, but a lot of people promoting them just don't know that. And as we get more nuanced into the depths of this discussion about what cultural scaffolding is, the clarity of just how inconvenient this truth is, is gonna hit us pretty hard. So how do we create the cultural scaffolding that we need if we don't have it now? Which is a big topic of this entire learning journey. Well, that actually leads us to the other concept I wanted to discuss, which is niche construction. Now, you may recall from basic biology or ecology classes that all that a niche is, is the part of an environment or the part of an ecosystem that some organism is able to use to make a life for itself. And it turns out beefers can actually construct their own niches by building dams and rivers. So as a beaver builds a dam in the river, it creates a stable, calm, deep water environment where it has plenty of food and resources and can build a shelter for itself that won't be uh, damaged by the currents of the water. So niche construction is when the organism, through its social behavior, is able to change the environment and construct its own niche. So a beaver is able to form its own niche. And what's interesting is after the beaver dies, its children and its grandchildren can inherit the changed niche. They can inherit a river that has dams in it from the beavers. And then they will actually be born into another structure, similar to a New Yorker today being born into the constructed niche of a city that has the New York subway system. That they didn't have to create it, someone created it before them. All they have to do is maintain it. And beavers can do that too with their dams in the rivers where they live. So this idea of constructing a niche is actually pretty widespread. For example, when a spider creates its web, it's turning the air into a food retrieval system. So part of its ability to be alive is affected by having this constructed niche. So its niche is not simply the space between the branches of this tree. It's the ability to create a web and then its ability to use the web to capture food that enables the spider to live. So this idea of niche construction is that the organism creates its own structured environment, which means it creates its own scaffolding for its own niche. For humans, we create social niches. Our social niches can be like this group of tribesmen who are sitting around a fire having a conversation. And you can see the social niche here is the circular space of the fire. It's the fact that all of these people are in the same tribe. They all speak the same language. So part of their constructed niche is the evolved structures and knowledge of their own language. And that language co-evolved in their environment. So their social niche is also comprised of a lot of knowledge about how to acquire food through hunting and gathering, how to raise children, what kinds of romantic and marital relationships make sense for them. And they're born into these social niches and are given a huge amount of cultural knowledge that accumulates within their culture as they learn it as children, develop it into adulthood, make small changes to it in their lives, and pass it on to the next generation. What's interesting is humans are so social that in nearly all of our environments are constructed social niches, which means they're different than they would be if humans weren't there. Humans actually used our cultural capacities to structurally change environments to survive in those environments, to serve human needs. And because of cumulative cultural evolution, they grow in complexity over time. So humans create social niches and then use those social niches as cultural scaffolding to evolve and change their own social niches. Or said another way, humans live in human-constructed environments. But we also inherit them when we're born and we can change them by making adaptations to them. And so they can become more complex, become better fit to their environment, open up new possible environments, new possible niches that humans can survive and thrive in. And that this can accumulate over time within a human generation and across generations. So now back to the topic of this learning journey. How do we live into the design pathway for regenerating Earth. And what I want to offer is this little conceptual provocation 
that there are a lot of entrenched structures of the extractive economy, entrenched in the same way cities are that I talked about earlier, or the way that that snowflake grew as an ice crystal, where its pattern of symmetry for growth was entrenched by the thermodynamics that limited which directions it could grow. There are entrenched structure, structures of extractive economies. And yet we want to create a regenerative life. Each of us wants to live one. The question now, like the million dollar question, the key question for us is this, where is the cultural scaffolding? What kind of cultural scaffolding do we need? What kinds of actors, what kinds of people, what kinds of teachers, what kinds of collaborators, what kinds of role models, what kinds of artifacts, what tools, what frameworks, what supports, right? What kinds of practices? Like, should I study permaculture? Should I take a gardening class? Should I learn how to cook my own food in a healthier way? Should I practice fermentation and food storage? You know, there are all these different practices. Which ones should I learn? And of course, there are, there's infrastructure. Do I sell my car and ride my bike? Do I move from the city to the country? Do I move from a country that speaks my language to a country where I have to learn a different language, where I don't have the social supports to learn that language very easily? And the entrenchment of my own language makes it hard to go to that one. You see, this question of cultural scaffolding makes clear that we need to know the roles of actors, the roles of artifacts, the roles of practices, and the roles of infrastructure as generative interactions. How do they interact with each other as a support process for this exact kind of social change? The answer is that we need to become designers of our own social niches. So if we live in social niches, if we can evolve and change our social niches, then we need to evolve and change them intentionally and consciously, which means we become designers of culture. Luckily, a lot is known about how to do this. We're going to talk about pro-social later in this learning journey, and we talked about it a lot on Earth Regenerators in general. But all I want to say now is there are tools and frameworks, principles, capacities, all kinds of things available to us for the design of social niches. And we can practice creating them, and we can look at their different elements. We can get more clear and more skilled. And here's the key insight for us in our work together in this learning journey. Every human group is a social niche. If you join a knitting club, it's going to be a different niche than joining a chess club. And a chess club is different from drinking beer with your buddies at happy hour. See, every human group is a different social niche. And what pro-social teaches us is how to form effective human groups, which means how to design and evolve social niches. So we're going to be practicing this throughout the rest of this learning journey. For now, I just wanted to make the point that cultural scaffolding, developmental entrenchment, social niche construction, these sort of academic or intellectual concepts are extremely important for us to understand so that we can practice designing with them in our own groups, including the groups on the community Zoom calls and here in these webinars. So you might recall from last week's webinar that I gave this overall path of the learning journey, where the first thing we would do is map out what it means to live regeneratively, and then we'll start creating support structures for each other, and then we'll help each other make decisions and take actions. We're sort of focusing a lot on the second one right now to say, well, what are support structures? How do we understand what are helpful and what are not helpful structures? Are they actually supporting us? And the answer to that question is, if they are cultural scaffolding for this change from extractive to regenerative, then they are. And if they're not, then they're not. What I want to do now is offer another framing of this, just based on what we're talking about now. Let's look at this in a different way. You could also say we want to practice designing social niches for each other. We want to become the embodiment of cultural scaffolds. What that means is I am a cultural scaffold for you. You are a cultural scaffold for someone else. They are a cultural scaffold for me. We are the embodiment of it, the manifestation of it. We are each other's cultural scaffolds by being in support of social groups. And this is how we live more regeneratively. So we're going to practice designing social niches for each other, become cultural scaffolds for each other, and this is how we learn to live more regeneratively. We become the cultural scaffolds that we need. And so 
I want to just stop there and say, let's talk about this. I know this is a lot to take in. And I want to just offer that what we're really talking about here is that there are supportive ways. There are supportive ways for us to know how to focus in on the creation of social niches. And by knowing how to focus in on them, we will be able to design for changes in them. And if we understand that this is scaffolding for change, which means we can take a support tool when we need it and just set it aside when we don't, we only use it at specific stages of our development, that we're just more casual and more easy to practice prototyping, to improvise and learn. And we hold the tools more lightly as we go through this process. So I hope that there's something really clarifying and empowering in learning about these concepts and that we can start to have a nice discussion about them now. And so if you have questions about what I've just shared in those slides, please ask a question right here. And I see there's one question right now that Jonathan has asked. And um, I'm going to invite Jonathan onto the screen so we can have a discussion about this very important question. And, um, and we can start to talk about it. Jonathan asks, isn't life an example of negative entropy? And the answer is no, <laughs> it's not because there can't be negative entropy. What there can be though, is nested levels of systems. And you can have lower entropy in one part of the system or increasing entropy somewhere else in the larger system. And um, the laws of physics are about open and closed systems is one of those differences. But Donna, let's have a conversation about this. What's, red what's thing. Uh, and uh, maybe Victoria's there too. I can't see you guys, but I hear you. Um, uh, what are you thinking about here with negative entropy? Like what was coming up for you in the, in the presentation that got you thinking about this question about life? And, you know, um, oh, I guess you've, you've dropped away again. So I guess my answer since uh, Jonathan um, came and went and dropped off is just that one of the challenges in defining entropy is you have to define what the system is you're studying. And this is like a challenge of setting up your physics problem. And one of the things that happens is entropy can be negative and part of a system. Like on Earth, we have this massive biosphere, but it's actually contributing to the ultimate heat death of the universe because the entire universe is the whole system. And the Earth is part of an open system because it interacts in various ways with the rest of the universe. And so the way that this becomes tricky is when we try to measure rises and falls of entropy is when we define the scale of the system we're measuring, we might get that wrong, or we might make some uh, problematic assumptions about it. And so that's just a, a nuanced piece of this discussion from physics that might be interesting to discuss more later. But I hope for now, at least, one of the key things about life is that life has um, what uh, anthropologist Terence Deacon calls um, morphogenetic uh, development, which means life creates its own developmental structures, and it does it without reducing entropy, but it locally reduces entropy at the scale of the pattern itself. And it's a very technical thing that we could talk more about sometime. It's fun to nerd out on, but um, I'll let it stand there for now so we don't go too far down, down that rabbit hole. Um, I see PJ has got another question here. So PJ, I'll invite you onto the screen. PJ is asking, so I'm curious around people's ideas, thoughts, and feelings around how we can be cultural scaffolds for each other while interacting primarily online and not very often compared to in person and not in person. And so PJ, if you're able to join me, um, we can have a little discussion about this. There you are. PJ, hey, what are you thinking here? Like, um, tell me more of uh, where, this, where this question is coming from. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, um, yeah, I, I don't have video on this computer. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> um, it, yeah, that's a whole nother story, but anyway, the, um, yeah, so I think this is coming up in a lot of, uh, various, uh, groups online, um, not just in earth regenerators, but like, you know, online and other social media networks and stuff of, um, figuring out how people can best support each other and be cultural scaffolds for each other. Um, and I really wanted to get the question out there because I think it's a really important one that everybody should be talking and thinking about because 
look, we're at a certain point in history and time right now where we are. We can't go backwards. Like you said, it's developmental, right? Like entrenchment. We're entrenched here. We have to evolve it forwards uh, and evolve it wisely. We have this amazing technology at our fingertips. We are humans. As humans, we are social beings and adaptable beings. And I can say that I mean, there's there's people on Earth Regenerators that I would rather have a conversation with and talk to um, and often do communicate more than other people in my in-person surroundings here. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we're all very most likely busy people. We all have a lot going on in various areas and we're living in our spots, in our places that we are. Uh, surrounded by others who may not be seeing and thinking the same things that we are seeing and thinking. And so just, I guess, trying to be as cognizant of the present moment that we are in while taking that right next step, right, together. That What is that? Yes, we might not be able to do a ton of stuff together and support each other in a ton of different ways. But what is that next right step that we can all be taking? And I just really would love to hear people's ideas and thoughts and, and feelings around this, because I feel like it's a very important topic, especially when talking with the incubator where we're starting to have projects and people coming into the incubator with projects. And, you know, on some level, it's like what we can do really is just sort of hear them. <laughs> and uh, be like, yes, great. Like if we have skills and, and connections and stuff, we can reach out and bring those in um, and form certain things like that. But in other, in other ways, it's like, yeah, unfortunately, like um, for instance, I'll, I'll just give an example with, uh, with Julian um, Wong, and I think he's on this call, but he's doing a great stuff with like regenerative education and reaching out in his local area. Uh, to the teachers there and starting to connect mm. with other people. And it's like, we would love to be able to help you to connect with those local people, Julian, like we could maybe get contact information and stuff, but at, at some level, like you are on the ground there with those people to connect with. So those are all my thoughts around it. Really curious to hear what everyone thinks. I'm really curious to hear what everyone thinks too. And I'm getting a feeling this could be part of what people are going to be invited to discuss in the Zoom calls this week. So other facilitators who are here on the call, let's have a little chat about that. Because I think this feels, feels very ripe for hearing what others have to say. And I think I won't say more than that for now because I already talked a lot and it's leaving us to reflect. So PJ, thanks for dropping this in for us. Super important stuff. Yeah, great, thank you so much. Awesome, and let's... um. Let's see, there are some other questions here that we can start to um, start to look at. So one that Gail has asked. So Gail, I'll um, I'll uh, invite you onto the screen. Gail is asking, can you talk about various regenerative culture scaffolding topics? What are some of the best ones for people to think about exploring? Ooh, this is a good one, Gail. I'm curious. First of all, what do you think is a, a regenerative cultural scaffold? Did any come to mind for you, or are you still struggling with the concept and trying to get a, a mental picture of it? Well, actually, uh, it was um, Kathy put something in the chat, which I thought was really good about um, uh, building your soil wherever you are. Um, and that ties into something I've been thinking about, which is, you know, I have a backyard and, and trying to make my backyard more regenerative, so that, that's one way. And, and, and the thing that comes up with that is I'm, I've done some gardening, but I'm no gardening expert. And I really, really could use some handholding. Like, you know, someone else in San Francisco wants to do their backyard too. So let's be partners on this and let's share information. And, and when I run into a problem, maybe I can learn it by you. And, you know, almost like a buddy system or small group uh, who want to do the same thing. So I see that as a cultural scaffolding to support each other in doing something new that we haven't done before that's important and regenerative. Um, but also, you know, what other topics, you know, obviously those who know me know wildlife conservation is a big one for me, but that's also a huge topic. And how do you do that in New York City as opposed to Latin America, you know? <laughs> um, um, so I almost think it would be helpful to have like a list of 
here are some ideas of, of uh, niches we can construct in this area of regeneration. And then let's see how we can be this cultural scaffolding for each other, uh, for those who are interested in these different areas. Yeah, you know, what's coming to mind for me as you're saying this, first of all, I love this idea. I think it's a great mm -hmm. idea. Um, one thing that's coming up for me is that I'm seeing two, two different like thematic areas that come to mind, not, not to be exhaustive as in there are only two, but just two that are coming to mind. One is cultural healing, which is like grief and trauma and social and emotional support. You know, having friends that you can talk to about this stuff and not feeling so alone would be a, like a, an example of that. And I see a lot of great simple ways that we could answer the question, what would be supportive things we could do to help with that? Like, oh, uh, you could have, you know, campfire talks every Monday at five and you have this group of friends you talk to. And so you can start to imagine easily how there's a lot to be said there. And the second one that's coming to mind for me is learning skills, like you said about gardening, where you're like, I would really like to know how to do composting. There gotta be a lot of people on Earth Regenerators who know how to do composting. Who would I go to to learn? And this is almost like, um, like if you know how an unconference works where you sort of someone stands up and says i want to talk about this come and join me in this room and i want to talk about that come join me in that room and sort of emergently create an agenda to do the same thing for like we want to practice learning how to do this come over here we want to practice learning how to do that come over you know that um that i think that could be really powerful for a lot of different skills including like when we talked about storytelling to promote our projects like there's the sort of permaculture gardening regenerative in the land stuff, but there's so much more. That's just like practical skills. I see those two as being, just first thing that came to my mind, you were saying like, God, there's so much there just in those two. <laughs> and, and Tyler's already doing this with seeds. I mean, we've been doing this informally and, and we even have, I spoke to Tyler recently about creating a channel on Earth Regenerators about seeds where the, those of us who are diving in can find each other and say, hey, were you able to get the guardian key and da, 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 and they'll know what I'm talking about, you know, um, and we can help each other. And they're doing that. Seeds, the Seeds community does that on Discord, but it's nice to be able to do it with people you know. You know, when I go into Discord, these are all strangers. I'm starting all over again, <laughs> um, you know, but here I already have learned some things that I could share with, uh, Anita, who I know is interested in seeds, or, or, or anyone else here where I maybe can share my experience in a more clear way, then Discord is very confusing. <laughs> well, you're actually bringing up a really nice example that gets at PJ's question a little bit, mm -hmm. which is that one thing we are doing in Earth Regenerators is creating groups. It's like, well, we can create a seeds group which actually uh, JP is gonna help Tyler set one up. And then those who are interested in the Seeds cryptocurrency can go and join that group. And that is a social niche. Right. That's an Earth Regenerators group for Seeds. And so this approach to recognizing that we need to organize around a particular topic and then creating a support space to organize us is a beautiful example of designing a social niche. Like, and I think Julian was yeah. starting to do that with regenerative education uh, you know, that's not an area I'm going to dive into, but I've, I've seen him posting about it and I know there are other people interested in it. I don't know where that has gone, but that's another one, you know. Yeah, yeah. Another one it. that's part of the evolutionary process is sometimes we need to change the names of things and reorganize them yeah. so that they relate to each <laughs> other more clearly. Um, so there's a whole process for that in organizational development. It's speaking of entrenchment, <laughs> that can get really messy. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, no, this is, I think this is great stuff. And I hope others who are listening, let's start thinking about what would be some lists of cultural scaffolding tools and supports that would help us. They're like, what are things you would need that you would want to have that this group of people can help create for all of us? I think this is a great question, Gail. So thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Awesome. Let's jump on to the next question, next topic. Um, I see uh, we have one here from Claire. See, Clara, I don't have the ability to invite Claire to join, but hers got the most votes so while I start answering her. She said, can you talk a bit about regenerative niche construction, which is a paradigm shift away from many of our existing relationships? What I wanna say about regenerative niche construction is all of you who have a spouse 
or a long-term life partner where you are ready to make big changes and they are not, you will understand the significance of Claire's question, which is basically, I might have to move away from some really important relationships, or I might have to make more modest changes than I actually want to because I need to bring along with me someone who's not ready to go. Like I would really like to just, you know, sell my house and take my wife and children and move to a different country. But my wife likes her job and doesn't want to leave and doesn't think as radically as I do. Just as an example, by the way, I have a friend who fits that description, um, more than one friend who fit that description. And so this question of regenerative niche construction, well, let's go back to what we talked about before. What is regenerative social context? It is where the culture itself is able to reproduce its conditions of being alive moment to moment. So what this means is the social supports and the groups that we form are able to function as living, evolving systems, which means, translated, they're actually pro-social groups. And these pro-social groups are able to dynamically, innovatively create solutions that allow us to do things like say, yeah, but my parents don't really understand and my parents are getting old and I need to live near them to take care of them because one of them is sick. And so we have these really challenging entrenchments in existing relationships where it might be, well, I've got this job that pays well, but I also have debt and I don't know how to get out of debt or else, you know, so I can't quit my job because they need the money. And you end up in this sort of catch 22 because you're entrenched economic context. So this question of regenerative niche construction is extremely important and not at all obvious how to assault. So I think we should all talk about this some more too to try and you know get those creative juices flowing and get some ideas. But yeah, thank you, Claire. That's a really huge question. And the implications of it are just resounding in our lives. So this is a this is a great, great question to bring up. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, I see the next question by the number of votes. Let me just be sure it's the right one. Yep, one by Bob Bates. So Bob, I'll invite you on the screen. Bob is saying, are we more at the communication level now versus the actionable levels of the regeneration itself? In other words, aren't we trying to get the communications levels higher before we can start using them locally if we don't already have any scaffold on hand? This is a really interesting question for me. Bob, I don't know if you're able to join me or not, but maybe, um, oh, here you are. Maybe if you could just give me a sense of, um, what are you thinking about with this question? I have a feeling you're talking about where you live and, and how difficult it is for you, but, but unpack well, it a, a little, put it in the ground for me. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. Uh, and each of us are in different situations, but uh, a lot of us are in similar situations. And my situation is such that I don't have a lot of uh, scaffolding sources at hand. Now, I do online and with this and, and other things, but not not on hand and and so uh i feel like i'm just trying to learn the the online part of it right now in order to decide what becomes actionable uh at that point where it's kind of like when you're learning in school and then you decide what you want to major in kind of thing where you just i learn this i learn this learn this but wait a minute that's kind of interesting and then we go in that direction and then it just seems like that's that's where we're at right now. Uh, maybe in another year or two, then we will have created more of those social uh, niches, and um, then we'll have more ability to have people where you get face to face and actually have actionable techniques, you know, done. I don't yeah, know, I you just, know. What's funny, you know, I don't know why it just came up for me as you were saying this, but one of the funny little just synchronistic um, facts of history is I was born in Southwest Missouri. And the year after I was born, the first ever international Congress for bioregions was like 20 miles away from where I was born in the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. This Ozark Bioregional Congress that was formed. And, and I'm just using it as an example that there was a time, an entire generation ago, where people were trying to do exactly what we're talking about. And so the question becomes, how much of that cultural scaffolding is just sort of hidden from view where we don't know how to find it, but it's actually been around in some form or another for decades. 
And so part of this, I think, is about uh, semantic framing, which is how do we have an understanding of the world that helps us to find and align with other people who see the world the way we do? Because you might have a neighbor who's really aligned and you just didn't find that alignment yet. Right. And so, so you can't lean on them for social support because you don't have a shared space of meaning where you both kind of understand what's important to do. And so I see um, one really important thing as a cultural scaffolding process is to explore language and stories and just how you talk to people around you. Like, how do I find with another person where we have a shared understanding? Or find that we definitely do not <laughs> and that I shouldn't waste my time. You know, like, I think both of those are really important. And, um, and so I'm just really struck by that. And I'm also struck by this, sort of social, emotional, and intellectual preparation. There are times when you're, you're just in a learning phase and you know, you're know you not gonna take any other action except continuing to learn, that's your action. But eventually you get to a point where learning becomes hollow and meaningless and you feel like right. you're just sitting on your hands and you gotta go yeah. do something. Yeah. And so, so, and we're all gonna know when that is <laughs> for each of us. <laughs> I just want to encourage everybody to put yourself out there and, and let yourself be known. And we know the truth of, of the collapse, but, and as long as, you know, we have that acceptance, we can be at peace with ourselves, then, you know, it doesn't make any difference what we say or as long as we're doing it from a, a, a an avenue of love that, that whatever ramifications yeah, yeah. come back to us at that point, from putting ourselves out there is just not important at that point, so. Yeah, and I just wanted to name something really personal that, that seems resonant here, which is part of my entrenchment. The thing that kept taking me back to Missouri was my mother lived there. And it's mm -hmm. now been 10 years since both my mother and my father passed away. Now I have two brothers and a sister, so I have family that's still there, but we're just not that close. And my mom was the anchor. The social niche was her house on holidays. Mm -hmm. And so I am liberated by the breakdown of that entrenchment, the collapse of my family through the collapse, you know, through my mother passing away. Everyone, next generation, just kind of stick into their own newer families. Two of my brothers have kids. So they, they have their own families now. That I was freed to pursue much deeper change. Like I don't have to stay close to my family to take care of an old mother because she's she's already dead. So the negative side is I lost my mother. The positive side is I'm more free and empowered to make more radical choices. And mm -hmm. so this is something that I just wanted to name that's really important, which is sometimes tragedy and loss is a pathway for transformation that opens us up to new ways of scaffolding our own lives. Mm -hmm. And this is just like, what a surprise to me that my mother's death which was very personal and something I still I still grieve about 10 years later. I'll never stop, I think. But I keep internalizing more of my love for my mother into the way I raise my daughter, into the way that I engage in my work, and I'm liberated from needing to go back to see her. Hmm. You know, and so it's just this weird way that the breakdown of structure is so helpful if we are emotionally capable of turning that grief into transformation. So I'm just, just naming that, it seems important. Um, Bob, is there anything else you want to add here? Because I'm just noticing the time, but I wanted to give you a chance as I just said that. <laughs> well, I just encourage everybody to understand what their entrenchments are, and that way they can get beyond mm -hmm. them. And, yeah, that's so important, understanding our entrenchments. Thank you, Bob, and I look forward to a lot more. All right, we are, let's see here. Let me uh, say that one's done answering. We're getting right up to the time and I see there are a couple of good questions here. Um, Marcus asked one and Pamela asked one. Let's see here. I think since they're both getting the same vote, if it's right, I'll jump on Pamela's question first and invite Pamela on the screen. Um, and let's try and do both these questions quickly and then just use our time well, if that's okay. Um, so Pamela asks, do notions such as freedom, choice, et cetera, make sense in this framework? How deterministic is it? How can we know that we are building scaffolding for a generative life and not just rearranging the deck chairs? And yeah, this is this is great stuff. 
So Pamela, again, thanks for asking this question. I'm curious what you think, first of all, do you feel like it's limiting and creating choice and freedom? Or do you feel that it may be deterministic? I'm just curious where the question's coming from for you. And then, then I'd love to, to, call, to riff on it a bit. Well, a lot of ignorance because uh, you're opening up a whole new way of looking at our life, life experience. So I am struggling with the concepts in just, just getting, getting through the words into some kind of meaning for myself. So the question's coming out of ignorance and I'm just, I'm groping here. Uh, but I guess my, what I am wondering about is how it, how it, how it can be that, um, you know, I was very, um, impacted by the trajectory uh, that you showed through that framework in how um, uh, of the entrenchment, I guess, of our existing system. And of course, we get uh, increasing feedback about that, you know, on a minute by minute basis these days. And how well i'm not quite sure if i could say it any differently than i did in the box um like how how do we know that like even through this we are creating um we are participating in and amplifying this whole technology and all of the you know uh if it's correct to say the outsourcing of um uh, this I like I'm not sure about outsourcing of entropy, but you know this technology is embedded in a lot of the contradictions that allow us to do that. You know, yeah, I think you get the drift yeah. of where I'm going here. So I'll shut up. I think I'm going to trust you to read my mind on this one, and I'll, I'll just hear. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you. That's so much easier. Mind mail. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. What I want to say is. What I want to say is I studied I pattern studied formation pattern when I was in formation. grad school. I noticed I'm getting a little re reverb, so if you could just like mute your speaker for a second, just while I'm speaking, because that'll stop the reverb. Um, well, I guess it went away, so maybe we're okay. Um, <laughs> don't know what happened. Uh, but um, when I was studying pattern formation in grad school, one of the things that really struck me was sort of like a, the hidden side of pattern formation is as a pattern is forming, so you watch this like pattern starting to form, what happens is the space around the thing that's forming is changed locally by its interactions. And what that means is the formation of the pattern changes how the pattern can form. And that can sound abstract, but I'll give you a really concrete example. I have long hair. If I, right here in front of you, just like shave my head, I would have made a choice that would be deterministic from a thermodynamic point of view, which it would take me two years to grow my hair this long again. So what I could undo by cutting it in like a minute would take me two years to bring back. I can't just, you know, take the shaver and take it on my head in the other direction and put my long hair back on. And so what's interesting about these patterns is as the pattern is forming, it's changing the context for the conditions for how the pattern can form. My hair grows differently when I have a bald head than when I have full head of hair because of the stress and strain from the weight of the hair and, and other things like the exposure to sunlight or whatever. So the important thing here is that the conditions that are shaping the pattern are changing every moment. And they're changed in part by the pattern itself. So the thing that is changing is also changing how that thing can change. So and there's so, something very dynamic happening with the edges there. Yeah. And what's interesting is entrenchment is the moving away from possibilities. It's like it's, it's investing further and further in one option. I mean, I guess I could maybe be a, a bit uh, metaphorical and say, let's say you're a young person and you're on the dating scene and you're just, you have two people you're interested in and you're not sure who you really want to be in a serious relationship with, you're just exploring that the more time you spend getting to know one person and spending time with them and prioritizing time with them, it's going to be less and less likely you're going to end up with the other person. Right? Just because that person might find someone else 
or might not feel like you're very interested or might get mixed signals from you and go look elsewhere. And so this thing is you interact with the different choices in ways that change the possibilities for what those choices can become. And while it's not strictly speaking deterministic, it is constrained in where the biases and tendencies are. Some things become more likely and some things become less likely. Just like I'm more likely to end up, you know, being on a third date with this person than getting to a second date with that person because of the way I'm interacting with both of them over the same period of a month. And so this is just a way of thinking about it to sort of conceptualize it in human terms. But the thing is that all of these dynamic patterns work this way. So you look at the climate system where we've now deforested most of the land area, put a bunch of CO2 in the atmosphere, and now the context of change is that context, not the context from 200 years ago. So the pattern forms in the context of then, and it's more likely to go in one trajectory than in another one. So that's sort of how, the, how what scaffolding does is you can shape the direction of the tendency to make something more or less likely if you understand how entrenchment works. If you can understand how you're committing yourself to that path and committing yourself to not another path because it gets harder and harder to change paths. Does that make a little more sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I guess I wonder with, uh, you know, as we're talking on this, um, on this particular, with this particular framework through this medium of how there is a, a degree of entrenchment here, of course, that using this mediating technology and how important that has been. And JP was talking about that. Um, and how, okay. I understand. I think I understand what you're saying, and I'm getting I'm getting a better sense of uh, the the terminology and its application. Uh, some of the what seemed to me to be some of the conundrums. I mean, it relies so much on not just uh, emerging awareness, but also um, one can become even uh, a degree aware of uh, entrenchment. Um, and those processes, but that doesn't necessarily liberate one from the internal entrenchment or the external ones that, that buttress the internal ones. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a process. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. A good example is I'm almost 45 and I'm learning Spanish pretty well. And I speak it pretty well now. My daughter's four and a half and she's fluent in Spanish and English because I did not learn both languages as a child. Mm -hmm. So that's developmental entrenchment. My brain got really accustomed to English and did not get accustomed to being bilingual. Whereas my child has a bilingual brain at four yeah. years old. So her brain will develop differently than mine could. And this is a nice example of how you can actually select, like we chose to go into a context where a child would learn another language because we want our child to have the various capacities of being multilingual. And so you can make design choices with your social niche. In this case, where do we choose to live as we raise our child? But during the window of time when she's small and learning language. And so developmental entrenchment has this time part of it is if we dropped her into this environment when she's 15, it'd be totally different than dropping her in this environment when she's two. So, um, so having an understanding of human development and language development, we placed her here opportunistically to become bilingual. And of course, now she is. So, so that's another way of thinking about developmental entrenchment. She will never be monolingual. We've taken that away, but we've given her bilingualism. And just it's a developmental trajectory. Um, so that's just an example of how this is a developmental process and relates to life choices. Like, where did we move to when our daughter was two? Uh, very, well, very concrete question. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I guess the the, the last thing that I'm, I'm kind of getting from that uh, from that story is how it may not be possible in for me to make the kinds of changes that I would ideally like to make in my own life at this point, but I could perhaps go so far as to assist in a kind of ripple effect that would have an impact on people who are more able to make those kinds of changes. Yeah. Maybe. 
Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. Also, you might be in a position where you can't relocate. There are various other big life changes you can't make, but you're like, but I actually see this project over here and I have surplus money and I could give a thousand dollars to it. And I would enable that environment to be more supportive of someone else. So there are lots of ways we can see potential and opportunity mm -hmm. by understanding our constraints and saying, I really care about this. I can't do it, but if I can empower someone else to do it, that's just as good is an example of us working within our constraints. And so it's partly just about understanding it as a, as a thinking and planning tool to help us make, make decisions. And then as a design tool for help us co-create. And that's, I think, where it's really powerful. Um, but yeah, Pamela, thanks so much. I see I'm, I'm not wanting to go too much over time, but this is so important. I'm really glad to spend a little more time on it. And so- oh, Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Much appreciated. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is a great conversation we're having here. I guess it's really important. And if it's all right, I see one more question that's gotten three votes from Marcus. And I'd love to just invite Marcus onto the screen if he's still here. And we go ahead and hit this question and then we can wrap up. He's saying transition management theory includes niche construction as one important layer for large scale transition, but which alone doesn't shift a culture. What else do you think is needed after there are many niches already? Ooh, I like this topic, Marcus, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I first would just love to hear, um, maybe if you could explain a little of this transitions management, um, this kind of, kind of this domain of transition management work. I'm pretty familiar with it, so I think I know what you're talking about. But just give us that context so everyone understands where we're talking about, and then we can riff on this. Yeah, so first of all, I want, I mean, this question comes from my personal questioning because I, I, I ask this question from a very biased uh, perspective because I've, I've been around for many years in, in many of those um, brilliant initiatives, transition town, permaculture initiatives and uh, eco villages and, and their networks and their global movements and so on. So I, I see thousands of initiatives and millions of people involved already in this kind of um, Different, different kind of culture. Trying to to really implement regenerative culture concretely, um, but it, it it we all realize that even after 20, 30 years, you know, it, it, it didn't have a major impact on 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 how things evolve uh, globally. Um, and that's why my question is, you know, is, is there something else needed than just creating additional uh, niches like this uh, uh, that mm -hmm. tend to be small? Yeah. Um, and from the transition management perspective, I mean, this is a theory everybody can look up and there, there are charts and uh, they, they have this niche level uh, where, where innovation can happen uh, a little bit hidden away from, from, from mainstream systems, um, trying new things and so on. Uh, then there's what they call the regime level, which is the, the dominant socio-technological and economic regime. And, and there's what they call landscape level, which has nothing to do with uh, natural landscapes, but uh, which is which are the overall global trends. Uh, like now we have all of a sudden, we got these um, uh, uh, carbon reduction targets uh, that have been agreed and so on. And, and now governments wake up that they have to do something and they don't quite know how, how they can achieve that and so on. But this creates a pressure on, on, on the socio-technological level. Uh, of, of mainstream to, to change somehow, and then they start to look out for, so how can we do that? Ah, there are some niches where <laughs> something has been tried out, so then this comes more to the um, attention and more generally. Uh, so transition management theory theorizes these three levels as a multi-level multi, multi -level framework uh, and how they, how they interact over time and so on. But I, I, I didn't want to push you into this, uh, this theoretical framework. The question is more general, you know, from your own experience, your own perspective, your own pathway, uh, the design pathway, what would you say what's needed uh, um, beyond just creating additional local niches of just a few people hanging, <laughs> hanging out, <laughs> trying to implement crazy things? Yeah, well, I think it's really helpful you gave that context because I suspect a lot of people will be interested in thinking of about those three levels. Um, and one thing I could say is, as you go up those levels in transition management theory, what happens is you go into more entrenched 
spaces. <laughs> you go up in complexity into increasingly entrenched spaces, which are increasingly difficult to change their directions. Like trying to change the globalized economy, good luck with that. Trying to change your local farmer's market, easier. And so there's this sense of, of that. And, and I think that relates to the way I want to answer this question. So I want to just pick one example, like one typical problem that I've observed. And that is I visited a lot of great permaculture projects. And the problem with them is typically they are at the scale of their own project. Like we have four hectares or we have 20 hectares or we have 50 yeah. hectares, but that's our project. And what is really hard to achieve is here's an entire watershed and this whole watershed is managing itself. Or here's an entire island that's managing itself. It's getting up to that territorial scale right. that I see is really challenging and really important. And I'll just share what we're doing now that is highly experimental and very early, which is what we're doing with the Barichar Regeneration Fund here in Barichar, Colombia. And that is that you know, we raised $50,000 in, in donations, bought a piece of land for $35,000 and used the other $15,000 to um, do various things. And part of it was to set up a fund for community projects for like $8,000. It's not very much money. And so what we did was um, I actually knew that to form the niche to try to create transformation, which was I wanted to organize the leaders of local regenerative projects and get them into a group. This is Colombia, where people send paramilitaries to kill each other, and they've done this for decades. So there's a lot of history of people not being very good at cooperating for very good reasons. So all of these regenerative leaders of projects in the local community don't collaborate very well. So I was like, how do I get them to come to the table? And the way I did that was I put $8,000 on the table. And I said, here's some money for community projects, and I want you guys to figure out how to make decisions for how we use it. I'm the outsider here, I should have no say in this. And so we formed an advisory council and we're starting to prototype a process of territorial design, of bioregional design. And because these projects are like, here's agroforestry projects where they're doing food production, here's a reforestation project that's also helping to repair some of the riparian waterways and doing biological corridor work, that we have a sense that they're related to each other ecologically, but they're not partnering with each other. So what we're trying to do is create a bioregional development process with this little pool of money prototyping a way of dispersing it into existing projects to help improve those existing projects. Like here's a community garden project among campesinos. Let's give them some money to help them get to the next stage of, in this case, they're applying for putting in a water sprinkler system. So they have to carry buckets of water because we can afford to do that for a small amount of money. But at the same time, we're connecting them with schools in three other areas of the countryside where the schools have children doing water restoration work. But they don't know each other and they're not talking. And so the idea is we form the social niche and try and create a social ecosystem, which is we try to create co-evolution of the niches mm. and just go up to that next level of design. And I said, this is really early days. We don't know how well this is going to work, but I just wanted to describe that part of the process that we have representatives of about 15 projects deciding how to disperse the money to existing projects while creating a territorial framework. And we're like four months in, so we'll see how it goes. But I think this question is basically you go to the niche level and then you go to the small ecosystem level of those niches. And you basically co-evolve upward so that the complexity is still relatively manageable because it's still an emergent process Control is not what we're doing by any stretch of the imagination. But I hope that at least gives a sense of, of how I'm thinking about this, to take those local isolated projects and get them cooperating with each other. Then I'm just curious, what is that, how does that land for you? What, is that, what does that stir up for you? I've, I've, been, I've been working in, in international networks of such initiatives and they realize now over time that the regional level is kind of the missing link. So it's, it's not sufficient to link up a uh, small scale local initiative uh, at the international level to have a movement and to try to have impact and do advocacy work and, and, and all that. So we, we need really uh, all scales 
from local to regional to international and have a, an intelligent, intelligent distribution of labor at each of these scales because um, the smaller scales uh, tend to be overburdened with doing all this uh, larger scale networking and exchange of knowledge and practices and so on, even though they can benefit a lot from that, but they don't have the capacity to engage in this really. And then we need an intermediate level or even two intermediate levels. And um, this is, yeah, this is in the making a little bit everywhere, uh, but this is very much needed. So I, I resonate a lot with uh, what you were saying. Yeah, no, I resonate a lot with your line of questioning. I think your question is really important for us to think about. Um, how do we put ourselves into these little bubbles? Like, okay, I got my friend group, but we're basically a palliative. Like we hang out as, and drink together and talk to feel better. We don't actually accomplish anything transformational. And what we need is transformational change. So this question of scaling up, at least scaling up enough to make meaningful impact not scaling to planet, but scaling to watershed, or scaling to sub-drainage, a tributary of a river system, or scaling up to a biological corridor. These sorts of ecological patterns and landscapes, mm -hmm. I think, I think that'll get us a long way. It doesn't get us as far as we need to go, but it gets us a long way in the direction where we need to go. I mean, the point is for me that uh, uh, these thousands of local initiatives, they all beautiful, but basically, mostly none of them would survive a major collapse of, of their society and environment. And uh, so there, there needs something else. And, and uh, I, I don't see it so much uh, yet. So yeah, yeah, fingers we're... crossed that you make a progress in your region and that, this, um, that we can model this in more regions. Yeah, thank you. And onward, man. I'm looking forward to learning more from you as we go. I right, talk to you soon, Mark. Yes. We're very nicely at a later than our agreed time, so I want to honor the clock and just say, I hope it's clear now that we're an hour and 20 minutes in that cultural scaffolding and social niche construction are actually extremely important and that we actually have ways to talk concretely and practically about useful practices and skills, how to form a social niche like when Gail was saying, let's just create a dedicated group on Earth Regenerators for a cryptocurrency discussion. But we can do that. We have the capabilities. And as Pamela was saying, when we do that, we enter the contradiction of entrenched spaces, like how many fossil fuels are being used in damaging the environment to maintain this global internet infrastructure while we do this. And we can actually live into and deal with those paradoxes. So I think this is really important to just name them, to say this is complex stuff, but we cannot actually tackle these challenges at any lower level of complexity than the challenges themselves. So we have to rise to the challenge in the ways that we're able to collectively design for social change, including how we make decisions in our own lives. So with that said, I just wanna say thank you all for being here today, for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can have more discussions in the activities. And by the way, for those of you who didn't see them, I, I posted some activities related to today's session that you can go through by going to the course page on Earth Regenerators and then going to table of contents and seeing a section on cultural scaffolding and social niche construction, where you can have more dialogue with each other. And of course, we'll have the Zoom calls this week. So I'm looking forward to talking more about all of this in the coming days and the coming weeks. And the coming years as we do this together. So thank you all so much for being here. And um, let's just keep this conversation going and onward fellow humans. <laughs>